Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. By, by my account, it is the second cultural meeting in Krakow. Um, I've attended most of them, if not all. No, no. Yeah. Um, so this is, um, I mean, looking from here, these letters seem big enough. But maybe they are. You look at it. Can, can people see these signs on the back? I'll, I'll go bigger. Right, so, so this is a joint work with, with um, my former PhD student James Dundre in Cambridge and much more recently with Roger Penrose and, and there is also some quite recent work. And, and the, the, the hero of today's um, lecture will be Luther Eisenhower. So you might be likely to know Eisenhower because he, he wrote many books uh, on different lines of geometry, Riemannian, non-Riemannian, coordinates, and what also he was you know, trained in, in very much in Kantan school, but, but became um, influenced by Einstein relativity in the um, 1920s and kind of moved on with his geometric knowledge too. Relativity and Riemannian, pseudo-Riemannian geometry. Then, after the war, he was a chairman of the maths department at Princeton when Einstein was at the Institute of Advanced Studies, and only then they, well, they started interacting and, um, and, and discussing. Uh, the paper I'm, I'll tell you about, uh, it was written in um, 1928. published in the annals. And so these are the early days of general relativity. And Eisenhardt wanted to understand the problem of formulating Newton's equations um, using ideas from relativity. So his objective was to um, understand the equations of the form mx double dot is minus a gradient of some potential, and this potential is a function on R3 cross R, so it can depend on time. Let, let's call this equation 1. Now, Eisenhower's idea, which uh, now we will put in the Kaluza Klein framework, if you like, was to so 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 this is a pro, this is a four-dimensional problem really. I mean the space-time of Newtonian gravity is four-dimensional, it just happens to have a different structure. Eisenhower's idea was to consider a metric, a Lorentzian metric in dimension five. So let's say that M and G is a five-dimensional Lorentzian manifold okay, I mean what, what, what I'll say could be described very abstractly without coordinates I mean uh, for the sake of clarity I will use coordinates I'll then tell you how to think how to characterize things about them I'm going to use coordinates little u little t and the three components of x on this manifold. Okay, and what Eisenhardt does is he writes down um, a metric, and the metric is 2 du dt plus 2 v over m uh, dt squared minus dx. So that's, that's, a, that's a metric of signature um, for one, for one for three. Now, this, so nowadays we'll call it a, a, a PP wave. I mean, I'm, I'm not imposing any equations for now. 
the P, it depends on P and X. But it does not depend on you. And this, um, well, what's special about this metric is that it admits a parallel null vector field, which in these coordinates is um, d by d o. And, and this vector field is parallel with respect to the Levy beta connection of this metric. And so the, the observation of Eisenhower is that if you look at the null geodesics of this metric and you project them down to the space of trajectories of this um, parallel vector field, then the images of null geodesics are nothing but the, the integral curves of frequency wave. Right, so prepared some colors of the gone. So let's say that this, this space I'm going to call N from Newtonian, um, and it's a quotient of M over R star. I'm not specifying over U is periodical, not, so let's say we portion it by the action of D by D U. Um, and this, there is a, I will say, a bundle over this space. That's this manifold M. So this direction is null, it's uh, with respect to M is D by DU. And the claim is that the null geodesics of M um, project down integral curves of one. Okay, and um, to see that you just consider a null, you know, a geodesic Lagrangian for this metric G, so say that L is for the U dot T dot um, plus um, v over m t dot squared minus x dot squared and you impose the condition that L equals zero so looking for null geodesics and you write the Euler Lagrange equations One of these equations will tend to give you vary with respect to you. Um, one of the equations is that t double dot equals zero. Because t double dot equals zero, you can use t as a parameter along this geodesics. And so you really are looking at unparametrized now geodesics. And then the Euler Lagrange equation with respect to x will give you precisely what. So I'm, I'm present. There should be one part there. Uh, indeed. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And the dot is taken with respect to any parameter. Well, I, I, I can choose. I can choose this to be finely parameterized. But but, but the, the point is that then you know that this equation is one arises unparameterized <coughs> because I'm using p. Now one thing you can do, and Eisenhower did do that, is to add a modify this metric by adding a term which is linear in dt, so like a cross term, where you take one form um, uh, on the on R3 uh, times dt, then the analogous calculation will give you a modification of Newton's equations with, so at the, at the level of this metric, you might think it's a magnetic field which you'll get at the level of Newton's equations is Coriolis force. But, but that'll do for now.
that's one way in which you can formulate you know, Newton's equations using ideas from uh, geometry. Uh, there is another way, and that you know, goes back to Cartan, uh, but I, I'd like to also attribute it to Andrzej Trautmann. So, so he, I mean, he, Trautmann wrote a very influential paper in, in the 1950s about you know, explaining Cartan's work to the GR community, and which, which gives a different, represent a different interpretation of one. See, what, what you then do is you look at a Newtonian, so the Newtonian connection, So you want to interpret equations one as geodesic equations, which you write as x a um, double dot plus gamma a b c x b dot x c dot equals zero, and my so x a is x and t. So the index a runs between one and Four, and the observation is that you need to choose uh, the connection so that the only non-vanishing components are gamma i uh, four four, and you take that to be um, delta i j uh, delta i j uh, d v by d x j, and if you do that, then this geodesic equations um, will give you Newton's equations. Okay, so, so you know, these are different uh, approaches because they, but they both use geometry, but, but the cartan trautmann approach uses a non-metric connection. You can convince yourself that this connection is not a Levi-Civita connection of, of any metric, whereas in Eisenhardt approach there is you know, an explicit metric in the game. And um, you, you can then say, well, in, in this approach, where do such connections come from? Can you obtain them as a limit? So can you obtain Newtonian connections as in a limit procedure from um, the Jupiter connection? So it arises as a limit. Um, and the way you do that is you take the one parameter family of metrics, let's say little g depends on c, where c stands for speed of light. Okay, and and the, what happens then is if you take a limit where c goes to infinity of g c, this limit does not exist. So it blows up. And however, if you take a limit as c goes to infinity of the Levi-Civita connection of GC, but that, in the right circumstances, that stays fine. And uh, you know, it is, it's good to uh, check for yourself that it really happens. And the way that happens is if you remember the formula for the Jupiter connection um, of the metric, you need to take the inverse metric and you multiply this inverse metric by derivatives of the metric and you contract all sorts of indices. But because you take the inverse metric, it, you know, it can be that it, the blow up is avoided and that that's precisely what happens. Right? Okay, so this is um, you know, classical physics. I will be interested in quantum physics building on this Eisenhower approach. So quantum physics. And uh, for that I want to write down and consider the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Lapdacian on R3 
plane of some function psi plus b psi. So we are going to give numbers to this um, um, equations. Then two. equals i h bar d psi by dt. Okay, so there is a very neat way of um, uh, you know, understanding the Schrodinger equation in this Eisenhardt formulas. And what you do is your, um, okay, so this was one, uh, this will be two, and then will be three. So go back to two, And consider the um, wave operator of this Eisenhower metric G and uh, look at the kernel of this wave operator but uh, let's assume that the functions in this kernel are invariant under the translations of this uh, parallel null vector. So I'm going to look at Laplace, well, the wave, I'm going to use the same symbol for Laplacian wave operator. So, delta g phi equals zero, but I'm, I'm going to take phi, which depends on c u, t, and x, to be e to the minus i m u over h bar times psi. Um, of t and x. Okay, and, and then there is an explicit calculation which well, is not found at all. You need to compute the wave operator, but you see that if you put this phi into this equation, you're going to obtain equation 3. Okay, and, and that's you know, so there's a big difference between the Schrodinger equation, Schrodinger type equations, and the wave equations is that the Schrodinger equation is first order in, in time derivatives, and the wave equations are second order. So what happens here is if you take the wave operator, you need to compute the inverse metric, there'll be a term involving a derivative with respect to u and a derivative with respect to t. But you made this ansatz, which, which only has u in the exponential. So d by u is going to hit this exponent. And then we bring m and h bar and all that. And then d by dt is going to hit psi. And then will give you the right term. Um, OK, now, now they can uh, digress. I say so it's not as good as I thought it would be, because there are three boards. But they can really only have access to two boards. Of course, unless oh, it doesn't go up, it's fine. They go down, but do people see if they are down? Fine, okay. So I'm going to. I didn't play it well then, but uh, fine. If I knew, I would have planned it differently. Uh, let, let me tell you a bit about you know, history. So, this Eisenhower thing is, is kind of simple and natural, but it, it lay forgotten. Um, and in the 80s, it was discovered, were rediscovered without knowing the reference and very much developed by Cambridge Marseille collaborations. People like um, Christian Duval and um, Kunzle and also Gary Gibbons um, looked at this. And only you know, 10 or so years later, somebody found this paper by when this was done. And but then in, in early 2000s, string theorists realized that this exists, and they immediately claimed it without any references. They still refer to each other. But, but it really goes back to the classical stuff, goes back to Eisenhower. I never found the reference, the first reference was done this, this, this reduction to the Schrodinger equation. Somebody told me it was done by Dirac, but you know, I, I, I know of no paper on Dirac, which does it. Anyway, what is it good for? So I'm going to tell you about applications. Uh, okay, and, and that will bring up this equivalence principle from my 
and also this, this particular one is um, joined with Roger. So we're going to take um, our focus on this quantum aspect, um, and we're going to take the potential to correspond to a uniform gravitational field. So it minus m g, where g is the gravity of the Earth, dot x. Okay, so what you do is you take this v and you put it in this Eisenhardt metric and you compute its curvature and you find that the metric is flat. Um, it is flat, but the, the coordinates u, t, and x are not flat coordinates. So you say, okay, I'm going to, to, to look for the flat coordinates for this metric. Um, I can write g as 2 capital du dt minus dx squared. This, this is meant to be a large x. And, well, I need to find this flat coordinates, which I can do. And what I find is that capital T equals little t, and capital U equals little u minus t g dot x, and minus one-sixth mod g squared t squared. And there is also capital X, and that is little x minus half g t squared. Okay? Now this is, so, so what are these, let, let's not worry about the meaning of capital U now, but the transformation between little t and little x and capital T and capital X is, is just a transformation which goes to the um, accelerating frame. Okay, so we have two frames for this Schrodinger equation. One frame is, you know, related to the observer on Earth, where you have a free-falling particle in a gravitational field, and another frame is related to this accelerating observer. Now, we can then write the, um, you know, look at this relation between the Eisenhardt metric and the Schrodinger equation, but in, in this accelerating frame, where the potential is zero, and, our, and, and what we find is a Schrodinger equation of three particles, so minus h bar square over 2m, like Laplacian on R3, this time it will be capital psi um, equals i h d capital psi by dt. So that's three particles. Okay, but now, now there is a, a subtlety. The way you relate the wave equation to the Schrodinger equation using these answers involves the exponential factor, but now this coordinate u has changed, right? We need to increase capital u, not little u, to make this transformation. So what we find is that this function capital psi differs from little psi by a phase factor. Okay, so I'm going to write it for you. Uh, so, the way we write it is a little psi of xt is a phase factor, and it will be important uh, for me to have it really explicitly. The thing is that this phase factor is cubic in t, cubic in time, over 6 minus t g dot x uh, times capital psi of capital x and t. So there is a nonlinear, because it's nonlinear in t, phase ambiguity. Well, nonlinear phase is not itself an ambiguity, but where the ambiguity arises is if you want to you know, apply the standard rules of quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and decompose 
the wave functions into positive and negative frequency states or much of IQ should be the same formula as here. So so capital U is quadratic uh, polynomial in T. Why is Q? Uh, have I messed up? Uh, well, it might be, okay, I might have messed up here. I, I, I have it. Yes. But this is definitely cubic. So must be this. Yeah? Yes. So ambiguity in decomposition into positive, negative um, frequency. Um, you can, in fact, I think I'm going to start cleaning this board. I don't think so. <laughs> I have an hour. I have an hour. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Fine. I was prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> ambiguity in the composition into positive and negative frequency states. And if you study quantum field theory in curved space times, you would have seen that sort of thing before. It arises in what's called the Unruh effect. So this is quantum mechanics. There is an effect which predates, I think, Hawking effect in quantum field theory where Pilamri showed that if you look at the, you know, the accelerating observer experience moving moving with constant acceleration in Minkowski space experiences a temperature. And the way, you know, to, the various ways to see that, but, but the kind of classical way to see that was to look at the Bogolibov transformations relating annihilation and creation operators in, in two frames. You, you can in fact show, and I, I, you know, I've shown it in this latest printing, that this, this sort of effect is not a latinistic limit of energy effect. So you could start with the Arnold effect um, with some potential and write it in cochlear molar forms and let's take limits carefully, you'll get that. So this is a non relativistic And now, why would this be a problem? You see, I mean, if you take the equivalence principle seriously, you will say that uh, there shouldn't be, you know, you, you're free to choose any of these frames for the Schrodinger equation, either the free falling particle of the accelerating observer or the linear potential of the um, Newtonian observer. Now, you can say, I'm, I'm going to, it's fine, I'm going to make this choice and I'm going to calculate using this choice, and that's in the standard quantum field theory perspective. But you know, Roger Penrose argues and has been arguing for ma many years that you know, gravitational effects should be taken into account in the um, quantum wave function collapse. So if you take, that's his picture, not mine, if you think of a massive body which is put in a superposition with itself, And a slight modification of this calculation, which we ex explain in the paper, tells you that you will not know, if you want to describe the system quantum mechanically, whether you should be looking at the Hilbert space associated to this distribution more mass, 
for this distribution of mass, and, and, and so quantum mechanics as we use it becomes inconsistent, and there is a proposal, not of mine, but a progress, an earlier proposal, which relates the time of the wave function collapse to the gravitational self-energy um, between these two massive bodies. There are some you know, exciting experiments, I'm told, being prepared to evaluate that. But and our contribution here is to show uh, that this effect is robust and not only restricted to uniform fields, but to other fields. So we, we are, use it employing Gaussian normal coordinates. So this is robust. Uh, not only uniform fields. Okay, so that's one example of the potential. But my main topic today, and I'm entering my, I've already entered the second half of my talk, is to talk about the cosmological um, analog of this. Right, actually. Very much hope I wrote something down on it. Yes, I did. Okay, so so the second second example is a non-relativistic limit of the simple space. Okay, so forget about the Eisenhardt metric for a moment, we'll come back to it. Let's just look at the decider space, which I'm going to write down in the static coordinates. Yes. It will be, yes, you were ahead of me, but it, it will be, though, there, there is a special limit I'll take. Uh, so the S squared is um, C squared F D P squared minus F inverse. The R squared minus R squared the omega squared, where omega is a line element for a round metric on the two sphere, and F is 1 minus lambda R squared over 3. So this coordinate system, the sphere and T and R, it does not cover the whole center space, it only covers the patch. But it is a part which, which can be probed by an, by an observer, so it's good enough for our consideration. Now, how do you take a limit of it? So this, this brings me back to what I call the carton uh, Chartman approach, where you have a one-parameter family of metrics and you take a limit and see what happens. Now, that's yeah, success. I mean, you're, you know, how do you take this limit? Well, naively, you just take the limit where C goes to infinity. But that's not a very interesting. And the, the interesting one, it turns out, is to take a simultaneous limit, so limit, where C goes to infinity, and at the same time, the cosmological constant goes to zero, such that something I'm going to call omega square, which is lambda C squared over 3, is fine. Okay, so you do that, and in this limit, the metric blows up, but you compute the length Jupiter connection, and, and you'll see that in this limit, the length Jupiter connection doesn't blow up, but leads to a connection of only one, well, only three non vanishing components, and these are gamma 4, 4, that is um, delta ij djv, where v is a potential of an inverted harmonic oscillator. So V is minus omega square R square over 2. Okay? So now, now we have a, we will know what Newtonian potential corresponds to this decision space, and we're going to employ this Eisenhardt measure formalism once again. So in, in, in the case of uniform, gravitational field above, the Eisenhardt measure is flat. So this potential is not flat, but it's conformally flat. So find that G is 
conformity plot. So G can be written as some function f squared times 2 du dt minus dx. Now, okay, so now you will want to compute the Schrodinger equation um, in this conformity plant frame. Well, you have to be a bit careful because there is a conformal factor in the metric, but the weight equation is conformally invariant in any dimensions as long as you're careful about the, the right conformal weight. And if you do all that, you'll find the following. You'll find that first of all, you find the conformally flat coordinates, this capital U, capital T, and capital X. And they involve hyperbolic functions. So capital P is 1 over omega times omega T. And then uh, you know, there is capital R, so the radial coordinate replacing little r, that's 1 over cos omega t r, and there is also capital U, which will be responsible for this phase, and this is u minus a half omega t squared, and now it is t squared times <coughs> omega t. And if you now write down the Schrodinger equation, you will find a transformation, a rather non obvious one, between the inverted harmonic oscillator uh, and it is this inverted harmonic oscillator which you know, is a non relativistic limit of the Sitter space and a free particle but the caveat is that the phase you know, if you look at the details of what happens with these transformations the phase here um, contains a real and imaginary part so this is not a unitary transformation so non-unitary but again at the level of these two Schrodinger equations you will have an ambiguity between um, between two different frames, and these sort of considerations will apply. Okay, so with my 18 minutes left, I'm going to now tell you about twist theory. Uh, yes. Could at least start here. So this will be twister, and um, I'm going into twister theory of non-relativistic twist states of um, the Sitter space, right? So, uh, twist. So I can see faces of people here in the audience who attended my lectures on twisters I gave in Warsaw two months or so ago. Uh, it will be new to you because um, these twisters involve cosmological constants, or a different bulk, you will see. So the, the twister space here in my arena is CP3, so that's a, a, a complex projective free space, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'll define it verbally, I'm not going to write down the definition. It is a space of lines, it, it is a space of one-dimensional subspaces of C4, three-dimensional complex manifold. And um, the idea of twister approach is that we're going to realize space-time, in, in this case the De Sitter space, as the space of lines, ordinary lines, in this um, twister space. So how do you think of a line? You see, these are, this is a complex free manifold, so six real dimensional, but because everything is holomorphic, you can use your three-dimensional intuition to draw lines and planes and then such like, and it's best if you do. So how do you specify a law in, in such a space? Well, you specify it by fixing two points, uh, calling them X and Y, and drawing the line through them. Okay. Now, 
I'm going to use a um, homogeneous coolness on this twist of space. So, um, call them Z alpha. This will be my coolness on the twist where alpha goes between 1 and 4. You see, so, so I'm really using this fact that CP3 is C4 quotient by an equivalence relation. So I'm, I, I'm identifying this coordinates if they differ by a non-zero mode. So now, how do I you know, specify a line? Well, x and y are points in this space, they are twisters. I can now construct a bivector, p alpha beta, so I'm really using the language of 19th century projective geometry, so this is x alpha y beta minus x beta y alpha. Uh, because these are homogeneous coordinates, I need to identify it with some k times p alpha beta, where k is a non-zero complex number. Okay. Now, what's special about this bivector is that it's simple. So, if you think, if you prefer, you can think of um, not bivectors but two forms. So, this two form is something like x with y. Well, what that means, if I, if I wedge P with itself, um, I'll get zero. So there is a condition on this P. You see, what is the, what is the dimension, I mean, what is the space of such objects, right? So, um, so this is an anti-symmetric tensor in four dimensions. Um, that there are six such things, but it's defined up to a multiple. So this P belongs to a complex projective 5 space, the CP5, but it satisfies the condition that P wedge P equals 0. That gives you a quadric called the Klein quadric in projective geometry, and it's a quadric in CP5. And it is this Klein quadric which will be identified with space. I haven't done it yet. All I know so far is that the you know, points, points in this Klein quadric correspond to lines in twister space. But there is, you know, there is no notion of I keep losing these things, no notion of um, conformal structure or a metric. So how, let, let's let's see how that comes up. So, so now I want to establish a dictionary between this twister space. CP3 and the Klein quadric. Space time. Q. Can we agree that the lines here corresponds to points here. So let's say I have point which I'm going to call R and the corresponding line I'll call LR. Points in the twister space also correspond to something interesting, certain two planes in Q, but I'm not going to dwell. But the punchline is that you don't need to impose or postulate the existence of any causal structure or metric on Q because it's intrinsic in, in, in this approach. So, and you know, that's a great insight of Roger Penrose is that the algebraic geometry of lines in CP3 encodes for now conformal geometry in space. How do you do that? You want, you know, what, what does it mean to define a conformal structure in space time? I need to tell you whether two points are now separated, whether they can be connected by a line. And if I tell you that for any pairs of two points, that determines the conformal points. So, I say that two points, R and S, are now separated. If and only if, the corresponding 
lines LR and LS intersect. You see, generically, you have two lines in three dimensions, they will not intersect. In intersection of lines in three dimensions is a co-dimension one condition, and so are the light cones in, uh, you know, in, in four-dimensional space. And it, it, it turns out, um, if you calculation, that these conditions are the same. In fact, I would do this calculation for you because I want to show you a bit more. So, so, so far, this gives me a control structure. Now, I want to extract a metric out of it, and not just any metric, but um, the city metric. Okay, so how, how do I declare a metric in this conformal class? Well, I'm going to pick a point, call it curly I, it's usually called. This curly, so this is a point, um, this is called the impinging twister. And the way I keep this point will determine whether I'm you know, aiming for the Minkowski metric or the De Sitter metric. For the De Sitter or anti De Sitter metric, this point <coughs> has to belong to CP5. Um, <coughs> it, it, it cannot lie on the quadric. So the quadric is in CP5. I'm taking this point in CP5, but not the quadric. For, for Minkowski space, it would be in the quadric. Now comes some very classical geometry. So first of all, there exists a unique plane in CP5 containing this point I and the two points R and S. And I want to give you a distance between R and S for any two points R and S. So what I'm going to do now is um, uh, what am I going to do now? Good. There is this plane, right? So this plane intersects Q in a line. And what I then do is I take this point I and take what's called the polar hyperplane I. So this is really an old Collective geometry. If you know about conic sections and such likes, if you have if you have a conic, let's say an ellipse, and you have a point which doesn't belong to this ellipse, then a polar line of this point is the line which you obtain by taking the two tangents and connecting. So I'm doing this sort of concept. So this called the pole. I'm doing this, but at the level of Q. So this then intersects the polar hyperplane of I at two points A and B. So now I have four points having decided what I is. I have RS, I, B. And the wonderful formula is that the distance between R and S is a half of the logarithm of the cross ratio of R, S, A, and B. And this distance, so it's not an infinitesimal distance, a finite distance, belongs to the conformal class I have just defined, and that's the, the secret. the sitter metric on Q. Okay, I'm coming to an end. So I, I, I haven't yet taken the non-relativistic limit, which I'm going to do now. So let's, and, and it's instructive to do it by looking at the symmetry. So if I take this twister space CP3, 
or equivalent of, you might take the space-time cube, then the symmetry group of both is SL4C. And that's a complexified conformal. But you see, I made a choice here. I picked this point I, so I need to now look at the subgroup of SL4C which preserves this I. So symmetry preserving I is a certain subgroup of SL4C which you find to be SO5C. <laughs> And that's a complexified deceit group. These groups both act on the twister space, and you can represent them by all more vectors. So now what you do is you write this all you know, explicitly in twister coordinates. And you bring in the speed of light and the cosmological constant and all that. I'm sparing the details because I don't have time for it. But I'm going to take the what's called the Ionu Bigner contraction of this Zeta group where c goes to infinity and lambda goes to zero, uh, such that c squared lambda is finite. And this contraction, or it, it's a known contraction, it's called the, it's a it's certain 10-dimensional, um, if I do it at the algebra level, 10-dimensional algebra, known as the Newton Hook algebra. So this is the algebra of the non-relativistic twist space corresponding to the non-relativistic limit of the Cita metric. Um, in my lectures in Warsaw, I explained that I didn't tell you that I explained what happens to the twister space. So I, I'll just mention that at the twister level, this is encoded in what's called the jumping line. Phenomenon. I, I talked a bit about that, if, if, um, and that is quite technical. What happens is these lines, which, which I told you about, they have normal bundles O1 plus O1, where O n is a line bundle of churn plus minus n. And in the limit which I'm taking, this type of lines jumps to O plus O2. That's a non relativistic limit. But the upshot is that once you take this limit, you can introduce potentials on top of the center space and others and describe historically all non relativistic space times and not only the Cassel dual ones. Alan Bullets talked about what you normally do in twister field. So, um, you know, that, that's where I stop and, and the, the kind of so how, I, how do I bring these two together? I told you about. Twister space and this Schrodinger equations, I'm doing this. So there is some non locality in, in, in quantum mechanics which, which causes, according to Penrose's proposal, the wave function collapse. There is also non locality at the twister level because the points in space time are global objects in twister space, simply ones. And hope is, and in fact, Roger and I have a proposal for this that bringing these two non localities together. You know, leads to a mechanism of a wave function collapse in a twister space, which we proposed, but this is where I stop. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we have time for questions. You have shown us a couple of identities related, relating solutions of various um, dynamical equations, both classical and quantum, uh, corresponding to different potentials. Uh, at the end of 60s and beginning of 70s, last century, 
there was in theoretical physics an explosion of such identities. For example, there is one-to-one -one correspondence between solutions of harmonic oscillators and free, and free Schrodinger equation. Then you have shown the same for uh, the constant field, the constant uh, field, and so on. And I tried to understand those identities because the, at the first glance, it is a, a mirror. And I believe I have understood it in terms of uh, um, geometric quantization. The geometric quantization, quantization is a funny uh, procedure, not well defined, where we try to represent something which is commutative, namely uh, classical observable of the observance in terms of uh, non-commuting. So it, it is not well defined. However, if you first uh, restrict yourself to, uh, to the uh, linear case, which means that you take only the group of linear uh, canonical transformations, and moreover, if you take from uh, Hilbert space only what is physically important, namely projective Hilbert space, then the representation is unique. And those, all those identities follow immediately from this observation. Okay. Yeah, so these identities go back, I mean, I know some of them, they go back to a Hungarian physicist or mathematician called Niederland. And they indeed somewhat mysterious, but the message from here is that if you prepare to use this Eisenhower metric, then you can put your hands on all these identities because they all just correspond to the diffeomorphism invariant. So you know, it's one identity which corresponds to the fact that the metric is flat, another one conformally flat, and, and there are more, but it, it's sort of a you, 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 uniform approach. Yeah, yeah, they are related with type. However, they were popularized in physics by Osim Barut. I see. Uh, what would be the areas of metric tensor that would support the Eisenhower metric? What would be the areas of metric tensor that would support the um, Yes, it's, um, it, 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 it's a null. Um, now, um, now that so it will be, um, uh, you know, I'd say I, I have this coordinate t. I would just have to take the gradient of t times itself. So it's it's, it's a null energy momentum tensor. You go to zero, of course, you behave where you get this constant z v homogeneous. That's right. So it, because it's you know you, you can ask when is this Eisenhower metric. Um, uh, reach it flat, mm -hmm. and that will correspond to this potential B being actually a harmonic function. Mm -hmm. So the obstruction to the flatness is, uh, is, is the harmonicity. So you, what you have is you have Laplace, flat Laplace in R3 of this function P times the gradient of T squared. That's this. Other uh, questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's start.